And for the first time in the history of agriculture that I know of, we have agreed to sit down and have a press conference as presidents of the five farm organizations. Sit down and talk about agriculture where it fits. Where we want it to go, what its needs are, what we think would be good for America, and agriculture's responsibility to it. Those things have been accomplished. And those press, that press conference will take place. Agreement is there. The date has yet to be established. And I'm hopeful that we can cause that to happen. Well, let's take a look at NFO and its future, where we might be going. I picked up a magazine on my tours of the state convention. I've used it a couple of times. And I want to refer to it. And I'll tell you what I've really got here. It's junk mail. That's what it is. It comes out of uh, a place, I think it's Milwaukee, and it's called Farm Futures. I've never heard of it. They tell me you don't have to subscribe to it. It just winds up in your mailbox occasionally. And the reason I became somewhat upset with it is because it quoted me in it. And the quote was that the Vaughn Woodland president of the National Farmers Organization has castigated Secretary Block for abating and abetting what NFO sees as a long-standing government policy to reduce the number of farmers. And then it goes on to say, NFO is living in the past. That's today is taking place. And I lose a little more confidence in the publication when I take a look at some of the contributing editors as I look at it, I find down here that we have Grimes, an agriculture economist that hasn't hit on projections for years, and Gene Frutel, whom I referred to today, who has missed equally as often. And these people become contributing editors to it. And then, as I look at the cover, it talks about where and what is the future, and it picks out 10 of the biggest farmers in the country and tells you how to solve your problem on the farm. These 10 models, if you will, tell you how they done it and how they're doing it. You know what they recommend? And I, I'm going to refer to some of these. And we'll see who's living in the past, if it's NFO or if it's the editor of this magazine. One of these major models is recommending that you sell your farm and rent it back. That way you cut your capital need in half. You don't have to have your money tied up in land. You only tie it up in machinery. That's the way they're going to do it. They're going to sell out and become a tenant. Well, that's, that's the first step when you can't pay your bills. The second step is that you sell your machinery. Now you've sold your land and you've sold your machinery. Now what do you become? A hired man. That's what they're recommending take place. That's what the one of the 10 big models refers to as the solution. He goes on here and talks about one of the other farms. You know, we believe in the philosophy is to market most of their production prior to harvest if the price is right. Now that's what another one of the Big Ten's going to do. You ought to follow their lead. Now, what are they talking about here? Marketing their production before harvest. You know what they're talking about? Forward contracts. And we have been doing that for five years. Who's in the past? Who's living in the past? And they think they have stumbled onto something new. And it's forward contracts that we have introduced years ago. The concept of a forward contract is simple. The buyer and the seller agree on a cash arrangement. It isn't the Merck. It isn't the board, the high-risk atmosphere in marketing. It's the position where the buyer and the seller negotiate and agree on a delivery and a price at time of delivery. You take that forward contract to the 
farm credit community and you lay that forward contract on the table and that does two things. First of all, it gives the producer some stability in budgeting his operation. Second, it gives the credit people some assurance of your ability to repay pay based on contract. It provides a needed service. Well, let's see what some of the others recommend be done. Another one here. The Leonard Farm has paid extra attention to pricing product between competitors. Now that's the twist, isn't it? That's what we call bargaining. And we've been talking about that for 20 years. Bargaining. You get two buyers to compete for product. And you move commodity into one that you can no negotiate and bargain a contract with, and you deny it from the other. That's bargaining. And here, we're living in the past. I'd submit that these people are living in the past. Let me see if I can find one more. Our philosophy from another major model, our philosophy is not putting all our eggs in one basket. The total bushel is to be marketed or broken into six or eight lots to be marketed over a 20-month period. What's that? Program marketing where you stay in the market and you move a percent of your commodity constantly into the market. Program marketing. Well, again, I submit what we've got in this publication is junk mail, and they have provide, provided a disservice to agriculture. How much more could they have done for the industry if they had to sit down and explain the programs that you and I are fully aware of and confident of. They didn't do that. They chose rather to ridicule, make light of, and suggest that we were living in the past. Well, where are we going? What do we want to do? Are we ready to do it? I have some goals in mind that I want to see accomplished. And I have those goals that I haven't talked to very many people about. And of course, they will be subject to board review and board approval at some time when the time's right. But I want you to know that the plans I've laid are for the best and for the good of the organization. The first thing I want to do and feel a deep sense of responsibility to you is to build the reserves in this organization. We have always been able to protect ourselves from delinquent, faulty, bad buyers, and we'll continue to do it. But we need to build that reserve where that assurance is unquestionable. And that is one of the top priorities that I have. Number two, we need to expand the departments. We need to give them the opportunity, we need to give them some line of credit whereby they can take some degree of risk and gamble, where they can take and expand their personnel, where they can reach out farther and service you as members better and your needs. We need to develop and design, call it what you will, field staff, growth and maintenance, it's a must. It's vital. And you must do it as rapidly as capital will allow that to be done. And we know what it takes to do that. You must have cash reserves or some ability to recover costs to operate that program equivalent to $2.5 million per year. It's hard to measure. Exactly. The income generated from such a movement and such an action and treating it as fairly as we know how and giving credit where credit is due, we project that we'll need two and a half million dollars to have that program fully active 
And so we move into it gradually as capital will allow. We want to continue to reduce and totally eliminate the 4 and 8 percent notes, the moral obligation loans that you as members contributed to save this organization at that very critical, critical time. And I can remember that meeting in Des Moines, as you can, where elderly couples came in and dipped into their life savings, even to the point that they questioned whether or not they could or ought to. And they gave their all. And if their all was $5, it was just as vital and important to them and this organization as if it had been thousands and thousands of dollars. But I saw elderly couples come in with tears in their eyes because they sensed the seriousness of what we were confronted with. I want to see the county, the district, and states share of the dues. And we know what it is. I know that over the years you have been asked to forgive those dues that this organization owes you in the county, the district, and state. And that's not going to be repeated. That's not going to be a part of my program. Those monies owed you for development within your county, your district, and the state is yours. They're not ours. They're yours to use to build and develop your programs and compensate those who give of their time but barely can afford to do so. I think it becomes vital that we establish some type of an employee benefit package. And you see these young people to my extreme left. These are all staff people who are depending on this organization for a way of life they have chosen their career. And I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll keep them for a year, maybe two, maybe three years, and we'll lose them because our benefit package is not equal to those in a competitive business or atmosphere. And they have to look out even though they choose and have chosen to work and perform for you. They have to look out for their welfare as family members, responsibilities of children and children's education and wives. And that employment benefit package must be forthcoming. And I want to see these board of directors paid off. Some of these gentlemen haven't drawn board pay for years. They've been contributing their time and loaning, in effect, their monies to this organization. And it isn't right. And I'll tell you what I want to do that I haven't talked to anybody about. I think it's time that this organization take its status and stature as a major farm organization. I think we need to commit ourselves geographically to a location somewhere and that we construct us an office building and not be found wandering around through the tunnels and hallways that that national office consists of, the maze of hallways and tunnels. I think with the stature of this organization and its acceptance in the business community today, we owe that to you to be, so that you'll be proud of what you have. I'm proud as punch of our programs and of our people and our staff. But I'm not proud of the environment that they are working in and under. And I think it was fine 20 and 25 years ago, but I think today this organization is no longer second rate. And we're not going to be. And our people can perform better in a circumstance where they can. Now, where are we going to get all this money from? Well, we can dream, can't we? We can dream, but I'll tell you the courts can't put us off forever. And they've been putting us off now for 13 years. And the jig's about up, and I thought it would be up by now. But they have found ways to postpone it a little longer. And I was wrong when I told you I thought it would be a year, and I may be wrong if I tell you I think it's going to be another one. But they can't go on forever. And I want to read a memo to you that they sent out to their members admitting defeat and that they were going to have to pay the bill. But they didn't know how much they was going to have to pay. 
quoting from a memo to their membership, we were disappointed but not really surprised that the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear our appeal in the NFO case. The Supreme Court cannot hear every case that is appealed to it for review and accordingly accepts less than 10% of the cases they are asked to review. The NFO case will go back to Kansas City probably to Judge Oliver, who heard the case originally per instructions from the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. He must determine how many dollars NFO has lost in marketing and membership and as a result of the illegal conspiracy, whatever the amount he determines will be trepled. This is their memo to their members. The amount together with reasonable attorney fee awards will be shared in some way between MIDAM, AMPI, and CMPC. And we have reserved a few dollars for this con contingency. Now we can guess how much they have reserved, can't we? Well, from pretty good sources, I know what the figure is, and I'm going to get every last dime of it, plus one. Well, let me conclude my remarks by saying the future of this organization has never been brighter. Our ability to accomplish our original goals are brighter today than I've ever seen them. And you're going to be making some very critical decisions at this convention where you go. And I hope that you review them carefully, that you do it from an intellectual approach and not an emotional approach, that you know where you want to go, and that you proceed toward that goal. And I think of the story I've often told, but the message is still the same, and so I'm going to tell it again. We don't like to be pushed into doing things we're not sure or comfortable with. We resist change. Sometimes even when that change or that push is good for us, we still resist it. And I recall the story that's told of the Texan who had a swimming pool in his backyard and had a party going on there, and he took his daughter and stood her at one end of the pool and took all the young men in the community and lined them up at the other end of the pool, and then he filled the pool full of alligators. And he said to the young men now, the first man to jump into that pool and swim to the other end, I'll either let him marry my daughter or I'll give him half my ranch. And about that term, time they heard a splash in the water and here come this young guy down through there dodging alligators. He got to the other end of the pool. He never slowed up. He just come up on the bank, stood there for a few minutes, shivering and shaking. The rancher walked around and said, Son, I didn't think that anybody would take that risk. You have gambled your life. What do you want? Do you want my daughter? Would you like half my ranch? The young man shook his head and he said, I don't want either one of them. The rancher said, how come? He said, all I want is that son of a gun that pushed me in. The point is, once in a while, somebody may have to push you into doing something that's good for you. And you may even have to push someone else. But I'll tell you, as we look at the departments and where they're at, some of the changes that have been made and some of the changes that are going to continue to be made, we're constantly reviewing programs. We're constantly looking for ways to improve for them to function and serve you better. A constant review. As you know, we have taken a look at the grain department of recent. We have decentralized. 
We have decentralized because we can serve the needs of the producers, the members of this organization better. And you can put responsibility, you can put authority, and that responsibility there, as Roger talked to you about this afternoon, the merits of that service center concept. And we're now involved in the board passed a resolution in the last board meeting that we review the livestock department in a similar way, that a committee be established to the board. They had studied this department. They had took a light look at each of the divisions, come with recommendations, implement those recommendations, have them passed by the board, and then our responsibility is to see that that plan works. Maybe we'll have to revise it a little. After we tried a while, we did the grain. There's no perfect idea. You take an imperfect idea and you fine-tune it and try to eliminate all the pitfalls and the errors that you find in it as you work with it. And again, we know where we're going. We're optimistic about the future. And with you, it's possible. Without you, totally impossible. And I bring to you the greetings of the rest of the staff that's in Corning. Somebody has to keep the home fires burning. Someone has to answer the calls. Someone has to keep a skeleton crew there performing. And many of those people that would love to have been here, I'm sure as they listened to the stories that were relayed to them of the travel, they probably were glad they didn't come. <laughs> but they have always been willing and wanted to come to the convention because they enjoy, they enjoy being with the membership. They're your employees. And I want to show you a group of employees, in my opinion, where the future leadership of this organization lies. Over here to my left, these young people sitting in this press section are 30 years or younger. Stand up. I want all of you to stand up. And they're not all there. I think they ran out of chairs. I'm not going to ask them to introduce themselves, but in my opinion, here's where the future of this organization lies. <laughs> now, I had to do that because after Walt paraded those four people across here this morning, I got flack because there were other people just as young and just as qualified. And I'm sure there's some out in the audience. I see Larry sitting over here. And I know that uh, some of the gals uh, wouldn't tell me their age, but they said they qualified. <laughs> and we have more of these type of people in the organization. They're becoming seasoned. They're becoming knowledgeable in the principles of collective bargaining. They're being taught and they're learning. And at some point, the leadership of, that, of this organization that you see at this table will come from that group. It must be. The youth is important. The training is important. It's good to be here with you. I wish you well in the rest of the convention as we work together. Our goals have not changed. Once in a while we have to deal with intermittent goals, but that ultimate goal of this organization has not changed. We have the right to price agriculture commodities. Our goal is at a level equal to cost of production plus a profit. And that theme you see to my rear, collective bargaining needed more in 84. If 16% of the farmers are liquidated through an adjustment period, you know what that means? Every sixth one of you won't be here. How often have you heard us tell you that in your national conventions? And you remember us telling you at times that every fourth one wouldn't be here, or every fifth one. Today now, they've got it every sixth one. The plan is that you won't be here. It's a sobering thought. And I hope that you're here. I have every intention of making your tenure in agriculture long. 
one that would be pleasant. That's what we're entitled to. That's my responsibility. That's your responsibility. And if you will do what we ask you to do, we can assure you of success. And we'll become responsible for the future of agriculture in this country and responsible for this organization if you'll do what we ask you to do. And I repeat a phrase that I have often repeated. If not me, who? And if not now, when? The bottom line is you and I now. Thank you and good night. It's good to be here with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll turn the time back to the Vice President. Thank you very much. I want to make one announcement before anyone leaves.